Okay. So this week we are talking about how to make a decision. Computers um, seem computers seem like they make all these great decisions. The truth of the matter is the computer itself can only make two decisions. It can only make they can only decide if something is true or something is false. And so we as programmers have to figure out how to ask the right questions. So that's what we're talking about this week. Now, for the next several weeks, we are not just doing the building, well, we did the basic buildings blocks in the last two weeks. Everything moving forward is really about developing algorithms. And an algorithm is just your computer, your, your computer language that solves some computational problem. You can think the labs. You can think the game at the end. But that's really what we're doing, and we're we're, we're basically um, using bits and pieces of the language to do certain things. The language is our toolbox. So this week we're talking about decisions and branching. Module 4 is looping, which is an extension, a direct extension of what we're doing this week. Module 5 is functions, and we get to take things and name them. Uh, module 6 is data structures, which allows us to start using larger amounts of data and relating that data. Module 7 is data storage. It's file, file processing. And module eight is object-oriented programming. So that's how we're that that's how things are going to fall out. After module six, you will have everything that you need to do your program, your your project. So we have some new keywords: um, if, elif, and else. These are how you tell Python that you're asking a question. When we ask a question in English, there's inflection in the voice. If we're reading it, there's a question mark. There are certain um, phrases that you can start with that indicate it's going to be a question, like who or how. Python and all programming languages have something similar. For Python, those words are if, elif, and else. If tells Python that it's going to make a decision. Elif tells Python to make a decision only if all of its related decisions have evaluated faults. And else is kind of if, you know, basically I say if all else fails, do this. So those are the three new keywords. And this week we're ordering. We have an order for these keywords. If always starts a branch. Elif may come second or third or fourth or fifth because you can have as many elifs as you want. And then the last thing is else. So, um, and you don't have to have an else, but you can have an else. So there's a little bit of, there's a way to play around with this stuff, and we'll look at that. We also have some new relational operators. We have a double equal sign, which is equivalent to. Now, for the last two weeks, you've heard me say things like, we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. The reason I said single equal sign is because now we're going to use the double equal sign and its relational operator. And basically, it compares what's on the left-hand side of the double equal sign to what's on the right-hand side of the double equal sign and says, are they the same? You can also have an exclamation point and an equal sign, and that is not equivalent to. And then there's less than, less than or equal, greater than, and greater than or equal. And that's the same thing as they are when we're talking about um, um, math. You know, you're doing math and you're saying, is A less than B? Well, it's the same thing here. So, new Boolean operators. So, we have 
relational operators, but we also have Boolean operators. And what a Boolean operator does it'll, it, is it allows you to basically add up um, multiple decisions in, in certain ways. So you can and your decisions or you can or your decisions. And basically, it, it, tells, it, it tells Python, if I've got a lot of decisions and they're all in the same statement, how do I make sure that it's all going to evaluate to true? How do I make sure of that? And that's just what and and or and not do. They say, okay, take the result of each of the individual decisions and then compare the whole lot based on the relational operator that you're using. Two types of Boolean values, true and false. That's it. And that's what all decisions come down to in all programming languages. Programs, sorry, computers are binary machines. That means they have two states, on and off. And they're really stupid because it's not even a dimmer switch. It is a light switch that goes off and on and off and on and that's it. What computers do is they do it very, 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 very fast, which allows them to make massive amounts of decisions in, you know, a fraction of a time, fraction of a nanosecond, which allows you to do things like play your games. Um, for me to have a PowerPoint, or in this case, um, a keynote presentation. So computers are stupid, but they're very, very fast. And that's why we can do the things we can do. Talked a little bit about this in week one, just to introduce the concept. But this week it becomes important. It's scope. Scope tells you when a... A, a line of code is available to execute. Up until now, it's always executed every line of code. When we've walked through the debugger, we've, you know, just watched it execute every line of code. That's no longer the case. Starting this week, we are going to have something called the global scope. By the way, everything we've done up till now has been in the global scope. And then we have a local scope. And that local scope is only going, those lines of code are only going to be executed when our decision evaluates to true. So, and we'll see this, it's a little easier to see and understand in the debugger because we'll actually walk, you'll see Python skip whole lines of code, whole, whole sections of code. Um, and then we have the built-in, which is just specifically defined in Python and reserved. So we don't have to worry about that. But what we do need to really think about is global and local scope. So um, every decision that will ever be made in your Python program is a comparison between two values. And um, you can have one of two outcomes, true or false. So if you look at this little example Python script, we have num1 is 42 and num2 is 18. Then we have this if statement underneath it. And we're going to go in a, a couple of slides. I'm going to go through the if statement bit by bit by bit. So if is a keyword that tells Python it's going to ask a question. Then I have this num1, I have the less than symbol, num2, and colon. So the way this is read is num1 is less than num2, true or false. This is just like, you know, when you had to do those true or false tests when you were in high school or middle school. Um, that's what they have. That, that's how you read this. You read it as if it's a true or false question. Um, and for our comparison, it's going to read... 42 is less than 18, true or false? The answer to that is uh, false. 42 is less than 18. It, the answer to that is false. I don't know why it says true here. This should be false. 
My apologies. Okay. We'll save that. So that is, that's what we're looking at. And by the way, over here on the computer storage, it's just a reminder of, of what a variable is. Now starting next week, I won't be reminding you about computer storage and the variables and stuff because we will have done that for three weeks. But I'm still doing that some of the times this week. So syntax, formatting, and scope, they all go hand in hand. So I have a Python script. It's challenge 3.2.2. And I have user age equal int input. Now we know what int input is. It's getting input. It's going to convert it to an integer. And that's what user age is going to be. So user age is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. If I look at the if statement underneath, user age, I'm asking Python a question. And it's a true-false question, and it's going to be, hey, Python, user age is less than 18, true or false. All of that, the user age, the if statement, are all in the global scope. They are all left justified, and I'll explain a little bit more about what that means in a minute. They're all left justified and including the else statement, because this has an if, and then the if all else fails. And then indented under that, under if user age less than 18, I have indented, I've tabbed, print 18 or less. Then under the else, I have print over 18. That's also tabbed in. Those are in the local scope. Local scope means they are only going to be executed if the um, condition, the branch above them evaluates to true. So actually, what's the next one? Okay, if else, I think I talked about that. If tells Python it's time to make a decision, else is if all else fails. Uh, the statement reads, we talked about that. Ah, the colon. Always remember the colon. This, is, this drives people crazy sometimes. My apologies. We're going to go back. Make this a little bigger. Okay. So, this colon right here. This tells Python to end the question, end the, end the if statement. You have to have it. It's like a period at the end of a sentence. Without it, you are going to get an error. You're going to get a syntax error. Python requires this for anything that's going to have a local scope. So for branches, for looping, for functions, for objects, all of that requires a colon at the end. Um, and I'll show you the errors that you're going to get if you don't do that. Um, rule, it's only the local scope if it's indented. If it's not indented, it's not in the local scope, and Python is going to give you a, a problem with it. The statement is a variable followed by a Boolean operator followed by another variable. It's that simple. So let's talk for a second about indentation. This is just a screen capture of Python or PyCharm. And if I look and I look at the blue line, that blue line is the first character. And if the first character is touching that blue line, then it is in the global scope in your PyCharm. And I've also got this orange line. And that orange line represents the local scope. If your code is touching what would be represented as the orange line, and for me that's just a single tab in, then it's in the local scope. And by the way, you can have multiple local scopes in uh, um, a program. So 
In this case, I have two local scopes. Lines 7 and 8 are local scope, and line 10 is local scope. Um, for every branch keyword, if, elif, and else, you have to have a separate local scope. And one local scope does not know anything about the other local scope. They are like they're almost separate little programs. Um, computers aren't smart, neither are programming languages. Actually, let's go off and do 3.2.2. This guy. Okay, so edit. Three point two point two, and I will just show you a bit of what I was talking about if I can find it. There it is. Okay, so this is PyCharm. I use PyCharm all the time. Um, so I am going to step through this in the debugger. So I'm going to, I've set my configuration so that it's pointing to the right file. So now I'm going to debug this. Now when I get to the debugger, oh, let's make sure no, nothing in the chat. When I get to, into the debugger, it's going to stop on a breakpoint. I know it stopped on the breakpoint because it's the dark blue line. And I can go over a little bit more about how to use the debugger and how to set breakpoints. I did that two weeks ago. I did that in Module 1, but I'd be happy to review it if anybody needs. So I'm going to step over user age equals int input so that I can go to the console and put something in. So I'm going to step over that, and I'm going to put in uh, 16. So. User age is 16. 16 is less than or equal to 18. Now, here's a nice thing about PyCharm. If you're running the program and you mouse over your Boolean operator, it will tell you what the result will be. So in this case, that result will be true because 16 is less than or equal to 18. So now, we're going to watch what happens. I am going to step over that line of code, and now I'm on line 7, and it's going to print to the console 18 or less, and then it's just going to print another line. And now watch. The program ends. It never went to line 9, and it certainly didn't go to line 10, and that's because these two are mutually exclusive. And what that means is when I have an if, and an else, or an if, elif, and else, and we'll look at that in a minute. It is a chain. And only one portion of that chain, only one statement can fully evaluate to true. Once one statement fully evaluates to true, it doesn't even look at the other statements. So if you have an if with an elif, or an if with an elif and an else, or an if and an else, you're only ever going to get into one of those local scopes. So I'm going to debug this again just to show you the other one. I'm going to step over. I'm going to put 42 in. So now if I mouse over my Boolean operator, it's going to be false. Now watch what happens. I'm going to step over this. Now remember when it was 16, I ended up on line 7. But now I end up on line 10. Line 7 and 8 don't exist in this scenario. They exist sitting in front of me, but for the running Python program, they don't exist. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to print over 18 and be done. So now let's look at a couple of errors. So if I get rid of this friend, friendly handy dandy colon, I'm just going to run it. And I get syntax error, invalid syntax. Now, this is one of the um, few times when you're actually going to be told where the problem really is when you're debugging your code. This says syntax error, invalid syntax, and it's pointing right to the, uh, the, the space after 18. And so that's what it's telling me. It's telling me that it needs a colon. By the way, 
pie charm's very handy. See that little red squiggly right here? That's telling me, hey, there's a problem. I notice there's a problem. So now let's do this. If I backspace, all of a sudden I get lots of red squigglies. And the problem is that I'm not indented. So there is no local scope. So this tells me actually that I have an indentation error. Expected an indent block. So this first line and all the lines in that block of code have to be indented properly. So I indent it and it's fine. But now, what if I did that? Well, this is different because I don't have a problem here. I have a problem here and it's highlighting the, the colon and if I run it, I get syntax error, invalid syntax. Now this is one of the things that can drive people crazy when it comes to programming language. That else statement is completely correct. There is nothing wrong with line 9 and there's nothing wrong with line 10. So why am I getting the errors there? Well, here's why. Well, other than the fact that programmers write programming languages and we're all really bad at writing error messages, this is where the Python interpreter has detected the first problem. What it's seeing is it's seeing, okay, this is, this is cool. I got an if statement. I got an indent. Oh, and they didn't indent that. So then I'm back in the, lo the global scope. On line 8, I am now back in the local global scope. So when it hits line 9, it's going to say, you can't have an else without an if. By having line 8 in the global, global scope, I've broken that chain of the if and the else. So it's no longer a chain. Somebody cut it. So the Python is saying, hey, this else exists without an if, and you're not allowed to do that. So the way we fix that is we put that back in the local scope. <coughs> so get this new scope thing, this can cause a lot of problems when you're programming. So these are just some of the things that you can run into. So let's go back. Whoops, wrong thing. There we go. So computers aren't smart, neither are programming languages. Until we get past the binary aspect of computers, this is the way it's always going to be. Um, so I want to say, am I younger than 18? Python says, what are you talking about? Python doesn't speak English. So what we have to do as programmers is we have to learn to break down the problems into parts that can be evaluated to true and false. And that is, that's, that's understanding how, how your tool works, how your programming language works. And it's also understanding how to break a task into subtasks. So this is how you're going to ask the question. And I know we've gone through this once, but I think it's important. If I say, am I younger than 18? So I've got user age equals int input. If is telling, uh, if is, so the test variable is user age. And so I'm going to test that variable against something. It'll be a value. The value could be in another variable. The test variable has, has to be defined and assigned before the if statement. That if statement can have one of two possible outcomes, true or false. That's it. And that's where we as programmers have to go and say, okay, I need to break down whatever my task is into component pieces so that I can get a true or false answer. And I'm going to print 18 or less, which is local scope. And then I'm going to print else, which is local scope. So uh, flowchart as a visual tool. We're going to go over flowcharts here for just a minute because you're going to have to do a flowchart this week. I know I've talked about flowcharts, but I want to talk a little bit more about them from the standpoint of a branch because this is really when you can get a visual, visual of why it's called branching. 
Again, exact same program. I'm going to input my user age. I've got print 18 or less. Sorry, I'm going to print my user age. I've got this shape. It's a diamond shape. And that diamond shape is a decision. And the decision is going to be if user age is less than or equal to 18. That evaluates to true. I go off one side of the diamond. If it evaluates to false, I go off the other side of the diamond. And then I end. Now, you will notice that even though there's a diamond for the if, there is no diamond for the else. The else is the final evaluation to false. So this is what it looks like. And when you're doing your flow chart, by the way, if you're in my class, you got to have your symbols right or I will take off points. The, uh, the skewed rectangle is input and output. The diamond shape is decision. And there needs to be a dot for a start and a dot for an end. Um, I don't care about colors, but the shapes have to be correct. This is in the learning module stuff. And if you are, if you're not quite sure how easy it would be to do in Word, go create an account in Lucidchart. Lucidchart is just by Google, and you can go out. It'll give you all the symbols and make things easy to connect. Okay, so we're just going to look at this real quick from the standpoint of the branching. So if I, Professor Lisa puts in 21, 21 is not less than or equal to 18, so it evaluates to false. And you'll see that it's as if that whole side, that whole true side just went away. So if I go back and I put in 10, 10 is less than or equal to 18, so I'm going to evaluate to true. The whole false side falls away, and I print 18 or less. So that's enough of that example. I think I have killed it. How are we doing on questions? OK. So we have one more decision maker. This decision maker is L if. So remember I said if and else are a chain. I can lengthen that chain by having elif. So these are uh, decisions that are mutually exclusive. What mutually exclusive means is there can be only one. Uh, only one of these will ever evaluate to true or you will hit the else statement because once they've all once one has evaluated to true, none of Python's not going to test any other one. That's why you have if elif. That creates that mutual exclusion. And when you are testing, when you've got the same test variable that you're going through, you want mutual exclusion. And you're also going to need to do this uh, for one of the labs because when I'm going to actually go through the concept of between because you're going to need this for two of the labs. Um, so how I read this is um, the first statement is if year is greater than 2101, then I'm going to print distant future. By the way, year is the test variable, and you will see that year is being used in each of the if and the elif statements. So that's why you want to make, that's why you want to use the elif, because you only want it to print one of these. And then I have elif year is greater than 2001. I'm going to print 21st century. Elif year is greater than 1901. Print 20th century, else it's a long time ago. So that's the extra decision maker. And we're going to go over the labs, and I'm going to show you some examples that are somewhat close to the labs so you get an idea of how the mutual exclusion in those labs work, because you're going to be using a lot of if and elif statements, especially in the one dealing with months. 
Okay. Um, so this is just a flow chart to show you how Elif looks. So I have now three diamonds. I have year int input. Each of these diamonds is dealing with the year as the test variable. And you will notice that the fault is the thing that makes the next one, the next question in the diamond be tested. At any point, if I get to true, I'm done. That chain stops. And else still looks like else if you look at the left. So actually, what I think I'm going to do here, instead of going through that, is I'm going to go through, this is what? This is that. 3.2.3, uh, nope, 3.3.2. Okay, let's go through 3.3.2. Very sim similar. So let me edit the configuration, get the right file in there, 3.3.2. Where is it? 3.3.2. So this shows us, again, LF. So if I debug this, now you'll notice I stopped at 14. So it's waiting for me right now to put something in. I'm going to say, you know, a 1962. So I have a series of mutually exclusive tests because that's what each one of these is, for car year. And I'm using LF because I am evaluating car year in every one of them. So if it's less than or equal to 1969, it's going to be few safety features. And then it's done. Um, and let's just say I do... Um, let's just say I do 2200 because order is important and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm about to talk about here. Um, I'm going to hit the enter key. Okay. So I put in 2200. So 2200 is greater than or equal to 2,000? Yes. And that's what I want. I wanted to say probably has airbags. Cool. That, that did what I expected. Now, what if I changed the order? What if I changed this order? So I'm just going to... Um, comment that out copy this, but whoops, make them a little different. So instead of 20, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this. And let's see what happens if I put in the t same 2200 again. The only thing, I haven't, haven't changed any of the code. I've just rearranged it. So what happens? So I'm going to debug again. I'm going to put in the same 20. Whoops. What did I do? I did something wrong. Uh, oh, I definitely did something wrong. Okay, this has got to go back up here. Now this will be happy. I, I moved, I, I put the comment in. You will notice between an elif and an else, Python didn't like it. So let's debug this, stop and rerun. I'm going to put in 2200, same value, same questions, different order. So if year is greater than or equal to 1970, probably has seatbelts. 
Got a completely different answer. I got probably has seatbelts. Instead of probably has airbags, which is what I would have wanted. And that was only because I changed the order in the chain. Because what I wanted to do is I wanted to check that 2200 was greater than the greatest check. And the greatest check is here. So be careful of your order. I can't. It's not going to let me undo it. Okay. We'll just do this then. Be careful of your order. It can change the outcome. And by the way, what I just did is called a logic error. It is, um, there is nothing technically wrong with any of my code. There were no syntax errors. But it didn't get the answer I wanted. And it didn't get the answer I wanted or I expected because I had the questions in the wrong order. So let's go back here. OK, Boolean operators. So far, we have looked at individual questions. We have said, if car year is less or is greater than 2,000, print probably has airbags. But what if I want to make a complex question, and I don't want to do it and, and, and it well, and it's not really appropriate to do it with just if, elif, and else. What I can do is I can use Boolean operators. A Boolean operator compares the outcome of two different questions and tells you, but it doesn't it, it adds them up basically, and tells you what your outcome, what the total outcome is. So it's like you're summing up the different individual trues and falses. And there's a pattern associated with this. Because you have two Boolean operators for the most part. You have AND and OR. AND basically says everything has to be true for the entire statement to be true. So true and true is true. True and false will always be false. So if you have, I don't care if you have 10 different questions in this big long if statement. One of them comes out false. The whole thing evaluates to false if you're using the AND operator. If you're using the OR operator, it's the opposite. True and true is always going to be true. Sorry, true or true is always going to be true. True or false is always going to be true. So with an OR operator, if there's even just one true in a sea of falses, the whole thing is true. So they're opposite of each other. So let's just look a little bit here at what the Boolean operator is doing. So I just have 10 and 2. Num1 is 10, num2 is 2. If I look at these statements, we're going to look at how they evaluate. Uh, my first statement is if num1 is equivalent to 10 and num2 is equivalent to 2. So what's going to happen here is Python's going to go out and it's going to evaluate each statement individually. It's going to say num1 is, is equivalent to 10. That's true. It's then going to go and say num2 is equivalent to 2. That's also true. And then it's going to say, OK, what's my Boolean operator? My Boolean operator is AND. So true and true is always true. If I have another one, let's say I'm doing you know, num2 is less than 2. So I've, that, I've just changed that. So num1 is equivalent to 10. That's going to evaluate to true. Num2 less than 2 is false. That's, so I've got a true and a false. And Python's going to say, OK, I've got true, and I'm anding it with a false. That's always going to be false, so that the whole thing is false. If I do the opposite, same statement, the only thing I change is put that OR in there. 
Then I have true, num1 is a, a still equivalent to 10. And then num2 is less than 2. That's still going to be false. But because I changed it to an or, and true or false is always true, that statement evaluates to true. So that's the difference with just changing the and to an or. You can change how the whole statement evaluates. Now we're going to talk about between because we're going to need that this week in the labs. So the concept of between is that you have a single test variable and that test variable you're seeing if it literally is in between two states or two numbers. So if I look at this and I am if I look at this beginning if statement I said if age is greater than zero and age is less than four do something. So that's a between. Age is going to be greater than zero, so they've been born. Age is going to be less than four, so they haven't entered kindergarten yet. And then it goes and looks at an and. So the important thing about a between is for both of the, both of the individual statements in this compound statement, you're using the same test variable. And again, order is also going to matter here because um, I, if I started off with this opposite, well, I don't think that would be a problem on this one. Anyway, so what I am reading here is I am reading for the first if statement, age is greater than zero, true or false and then age is less than four, true or false. And that basically says age is between zero and three, or is one and three, because I'm using a greater and a less than. The next statement is age greater than or equal to four, and age less than nine. So we'll know that age, it's between four and eight, greater than or equal, is inclusive of the number. So it would be 4 between 4 and 8. Age greater than 9, greater than or equal to 9, and less than 13 is between 9 and 12. And age greater than, th greater than or equal to 13 and less than 19 is 13 and 18. So and the else is anything greater than 18. So that's how you read all of these. And you'll notice with the between, I'm using an and. It has to be an and. It cannot be an or if you're doing a between. Okay. So let me see. Complex questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to that one, and we're gonna look at some between. What does that one do? Yeah, they they don't. Okay, between. So what? What do I want to say? Um, that's what I wanted to say. Okay. So let me do this. And let's just run through this one really quick so that we can see how it works. I just wanted to show you in the debugger how the between looks. So if I do this, and I'm going to make the age 10. So again, a nice thing about PyCharm is I can mouse over the Boolean operator. I can also mouse over the relational operator. And you'll see that the age stuff just changed all to gray. And that's because it's telling me that the entire thing evaluates to false. Because 10 is greater than 0, so that would evaluate to true. 
but 10 is not less than 4. So that's going to evaluate to false. So it's just going to step over. And then age is greater than or equal to 4. That's very true. Age is less than or 9. That's false. And now I have age is greater than or equal to 9. True. Age is less than 13. Also true. So I have a true and a true. So I evaluate to true. I'm going to step over. I'm in middle school. And I'm done. So it skipped everything else. It doesn't even do the checks. So let's go to complex questions. So um, this is related to, to the change lab. And we're going to, I'm just going to talk about it for a minute and talk about the use of the floor operator because you need to have used the floor operator for the lab that deals with coins. Um, so I have a set of complex questions that I've got to answer. And um, so I have a number, 223. I just picked that out of thin air. And I want to find out how many, find the number of 100s and the number of 10s or dimes that go into 223. So I have to use the floor operator here. I cannot use the modular operator. It doesn't work properly. The, ca the, um, the calculations don't come out right. So if I say I have 100s equal to 223, uh, floor 100, I'm going to get back 2. I'm going to say num equal num minus 100s times 100. And then I'm going to say 10s equal num modula, sorry, floor 10, and I'm going to get 2. So then I have a series of questions I have to ask. And this is going to, I think, go on to the next page. If hundreds is equal, is equivalent to 0, I'm going to say no hundreds. If hundreds is greater than 1, I'm going to say number of hundreds is, and then tell it how many hundreds. Else, there aren't any hundreds. So that's just that series of complex questions. Um, OK and OK. And then we have the same thing for 10. So it's a pattern. So I have 10s is there, no 10s. 10s greater than 1 number of 10s is, and I print it out. Other than that, I have a single 10, one 10. Um, OK, greater than true, false, none. The result is true. OK. Um, I'm sorry, Professor. Before you got too far away, I had a question about this slide you just got off of. It's OK, in... that's fine. I was going to go do a, um, a lab. This slide? Yes, that one. I was just asking, why is that? Um, why is that last? Why is that else statement needed at the end? If you already have at the beginning, if hundreds are equivalent to zero, print no hundreds. Um, because I put the wrong thing in there. Okay. That's why. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. No problem. So that's why it's needed there because it's going to say there's only one of them. Gotcha. Sorry. I put the wrong I put the wrong output there. So let's Okay. Uh, I don't ha I'm glad you like the YouTube videos. Okay, and I'm glad I answered that. Cuz you were right, it was stated earlier. Um, so this is just a flow chart of what we just did. And it's just to give you a visual tool of where you're going to have your if, your else's, and your elifs. So let's do this. 
what do I want to talk about? There is floor uh, compare lists. That's not it. Okay, that's the between one. Compound. That's the compound. Okay, so this is one that is similar to a lab. And I don't go through the whole thing, but I did want to got, give you guys the patterns because these labs are long. They're big labs. They're going to require um, a good amount of programming time and a good amount of debugging time. My suggestion is if you are in Zybooks and it's driving you crazy, copy your code out into PyCharm, run it in PyCharm, and then copy it back into Zybooks. Because PyCharm makes it easier because it tells you automatically if you have a syntax error and it's easier to figure out logic errors. So I've got some money and I've got 1142. Hundreds is 100, quarters is 25. So I want to see how many, uh, how, much, how many dollars I have and how many quarters I have. So I'm going to, uh, oops, no, wrong one, floor, there. I'm going to run through this, oops, nope, there we go, and I want to show you what's going to happen. So you've got this section of code here when you do this lab, and that section of code is simply calculations. It is all in the global scope. It has nothing to do with branching, but it will control your, the outcome will control your branching later. So I'm going to say I've got dollars, dollars, a floor on 100 is 11. I'm going to print dollars. I have amount of, uh, is money minus dollars times 100. So my new amount is 42, which is what it should be. I'm going to determine the number of quarters I have in it. I have a single quarter. Now I get down to the if statements. So here I have compounded, I have nested if statements. And this is what you're going to have to do for the program. Because you can nest if statements. You can nest them any way you want. An if statement contain, can contain as many if statements as need be. I was writing a programming language once many, many, many years ago. And I think I had... 110 if statements dealing with syntax issues. A single if statement, if, elif, 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 blah, blah, blah. 110 of them. So I don't recommend that, but sometimes you can't avoid it. So I have, I have my if statement for dollars. Dollars is 11. Dollars is greater than zero, which is true. So I'm going to step over that, which is going to put me into the local scope of my if for my dollars being more than zero. Now I'm going to print dollars and equal. So I'm going to print the number. So I have 11 and I'm going to end, and I'm saying end equal space because I don't want a new line right away. Then I'm going to evaluate the number that I have. Do I have one dollar or do I have multiple dollars? So if I have one dollar, if dollar is equivalent to one, then I'm going to print dollar. If dollar is not equivalent to one and I'm already in it, I'm already here and I know that it has more than zero, then I'm going to print dollars. So I've used the first if statement to determine whether I should even do the rest of it. And then I'm using the inner if statements to determine how I want to do something. So if I step over this, I'm going to print dollars. So I have $11. So now I'm at quarters. Do I have more than zero quarters? Yes, I do. So I've evaluated the fact that I have more than zero quarters. So now I can do the rest of it. I can print the number of quarters, which is one. And uh, here I have if quarters is equivalent to one, which is true, I'm going to print quarter. So this, these are nested if statements. 
and you're going to need them for two of your labs this week and they're kind of complex. And what you want to do when you're evaluating it is you want to take for the for the the first if statement for the outer if statement you want to look for the broadest stroke. So what's the biggest thing I have to evaluate for? Well, the first thing I have to evaluate for is do I want to print any of this stuff anyway? Because if there aren't any dollars, you're not going to print a thing. You're just going to move on to the next. If there aren't any dimes, you're not going to print a thing. You're just going to move on to the next. So that's the biggest thing. And then after that, you can look at the, the smaller details. You can look at how many dollars do I have? Do I only have a single dollar? So I print the singular for dollar. Or do I have lots of dollars and I print the plural? So that's kind of how you determine what is your outer if statement and what is your inner if statement. Okay, so pseudocode. We're going to start using pseudocode this week, partly because the flowcharts are just too big for a slide, but partly because you're going to use this a lot in um, the rest of the class. Most people, um, some people will do flowcharts, but most people when they have the opportunity to say do a flowchart or pseudocode, they choose to do pseudocode. So this is lab 3.11 and you're going to write a program whose inputs are three integers and whose output is the smallest of three integers. This is learning how to do a min. Um, so what you're going to do is this is going to require an if, an elif, and an else. The if and the elif are both compound statements, so they have multiple, they have multiple evaluations and you're going to use AND as the Boolean operator. Basically, you've got first, second, and third. Those are your three numbers. And you're going to say if first is less than or equal to second and first is less than or equal to third. So if I'm looking here, I'm saying I'm going to take my first number and I'm going to see if it's the smallest number right off the bat. If both of those expressions evaluate to true, then you're going to output that first number. If either of those expressions evaluate to false, then you're going to look at the second number. You're going to do the exact same thing. In this case, it's is second less than or equal to first and is second less than or equal to third. So I'm now testing second, and I'm looking to see if it's smaller than both of them. If both of those evaluate to true, because I'm using AND as the Boolean operator, then you're going to output second. Otherwise, the only thing you got left is to output third. So that is, you're, you're creating your own min function, your own minimum function. This does not require nested if statements. However, this does. So you're going to write a program that takes a date as input and outputs the date's season. The input is a string to represent the month, an int to represent the day. So you've got to test some things here because Zybooks can get a little dastardly. Zybooks is going to give you a date like minus 1 September. Well, you have to be able to tell Zybooks that that's an invalid date because minus 1 is not a valid day. So you're going to have to check month and day. Now, I've seen people try and do this in a, a more um, efficient manner. And it can be done, but you usually have to use data structures. And since we haven't gotten to data structures, there's just a lot of code to write. So the first thing I'm going to evaluate is the month, because I, I, I've got some pretty strict seasons when it comes to the dates, because there are some, some months that are winter. January is winter. February is winter. But there are some months that are going to split between like winter and spring, like March. So that's what I have to know first. What is What month am I in? 
And by the way, you're going to see all these elif and else. And then you've got this very, at the very bottom, very end, you have an else output invalid. So if all fails, you're just going to print out invalid, and you have to make sure you do that, or you will probably get some of Xi books, um, little yellow things that say, you know, your output didn't match the output I was expecting. So check month first then check the days. And you have to make sure that you have the right number of days. Now, don't worry about leap year or non-leap year for February. Just do equal to 20, less than or equal to 29. The interesting ones come in when you get to something like March. March ha can have two different months. <coughs> Sorry, two different seasons. So, <coughs> The first thing I'm going to check is if the month is March for March. If it is, then I'm going to do those between things that we did before. If day is greater than zero and day is less than or equal to 19, so the day is between 1 and 19, then I'm going to be in winter. And now I've got another between to determine if I'm spring. And I'm going to say if day is greater than 19 and day is less than or equal to 31. So between 20 and 31, I'm spring. Otherwise, it's invalid. So for all of the ones that, uh, that um, split, where the month is split by season, you're going to have to use this pattern, if, elif, and else, because... If I have elif month equals March, I've evaluated to true. So even if it gives me, you know, minus 7 March, I'll never get to that very bottom output invalid because it evaluated true for March. So I have to take care of that invalid um, output and that invalid check, basically, inside that, that nested if statement. But that's the pattern that you use. If it's split, you use the pattern for March. If it's not, you can have it all on one line. So now we're going to write a program with a total change amount as an integer um, input and output the change using the fewest coins, one coin type per line. So you have dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So I'm going to input some number. The first thing you want to do here, now that we have if statements, is you want to make sure that your input val is not less than or equal to zero. If they give you a minus 79, you're going to say there's no change because it's a negative number. Otherwise, you're going to do those, cal those floor calculations like we talked about in that previous slide. Then you're going to get down here and you're going to check and say, are there any dollars? If there are dollars, then do I print the plural or the singular? And then you're going to do that exact same thing for quarters. This is a pattern. Follow the pattern. I'm going to say if number of quarters is greater than zero, then I know I have to print quarters. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to do the inner if statements. Number of quarters is equivalent to one. You output the singular for quarter. Otherwise, you output the plural quarters, and you do that for everything. But you have to make sure that you check to make, at the very beginning to make sure that they didn't give you a negative number because PyTor or Zybooks will do that. Okay, I know I went over a little bit. I apologize. Does anybody have any questions? Going once. This was really Going. good. Um, I've completed most of the lab for this week, but I this opened my eyes to like way even more. Um, I guess the only question I have is kind of related, but kind of not. So, like I've been able to do the labs for the most part so far, but like, can you recommend I guess more strategies or just like any words of advice as far as like transferring what the modules are asking you to do or like the prompts to like being able to think it, like you said, like kind of 
writing pseudocode first before you start programming because that's feels really difficult and like robotic for me right now to kind of transfer the words into breaking it down into edible sizes in order to digest it. Um, it's it can be very difficult learning to think this way is um, is it's often new and and foreign to a lot of students. I know a few people who have gotten programming just because they they breathe. I'm not one of those. I have to study. <laughs> um, there is a book called Think Like a Programmer. And it's written by, it's, I, I recommend this to a lot of students. And it uses Python for its examples. But it really talks about the skill of logically breaking down problems so that you can build the solution as a program. And it's, it is learning to, um, some cases it's learning to read between the lines. Some cases it is understanding because I think that as humans, the way we communicate is so much broader than, than com we can communicate with computers, it's almost a process of dumbing things down. Um, so, and that, that's foreign and that's hard. That there are some times when it's still hard for me. Um, my, my, one of the suggestions I have to most students is, Use PyCharm. For these big labs, use PyCharm. Don't just use PyCharm to, to do the, you know, the, the test information they give you, but put in other things. Put in minus one when you're running it. Put in, you know, 1,024 or whatever and see if it comes out and it makes sense. Walk through and use the debugger like I've used the debugger if things aren't happening because it will show you where things are going wrong. And then you'll begin to understand, the more you do these, the more you'll begin to understand, okay, this is how I do this. You'll recognize something and say, oh, this is a between. I know how to do a between. And this is a whatever, and I know how to do that. And you'll start to build up a library almost in your brain of how to do, uh, once you recognize something, how to do it. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Is the, um, the book Think Like a Programmer, is it Think Like a Programmer and in, an in intro to creative problem solving? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. It's a very good book, and, and it helps you shift your mindset because learning to program is a paradigm shift. Once you've made that paradigm shift, it's not a problem. But going through the process of doing that paradigm shift can sometimes be a bit mentally painful. And that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. <laughs> um, are you in my, I don't think you're in my class, Jordan. No, I'm not. I'm in um, Professor Wright's class. Um, okay. I don't know Professor Wright. Usually if they're, for students in my class, I always, um, I always ask them to reach out to me. Don't get frustrated. Don't get stuck. If you're frustrated and get stuck, you know, for my students, I tell them to reach out to me. Um, I kind of can't do that. I think I'd be stepping on toes. Um, right. Yeah, I understand. I, I've reached out to her a few times. She's um she's helped me through some things, but that's good. I, okay. I do enjoy I do enjoy how you kind of uh, put forth this information. So I get a lot of value from that as well. I'm glad. I'm glad you get some information. Um, so I'm going to call this, and you guys have a wonderful weekend. If you're I did have class. one question as well. Yes. Uh, so I don't like to assume anything, and I haven't even started Module 3 yet. Is the floor function explained somewhere at the beginning of Module 3? The what function? Floor. Uh, the floor is an operator. Okay. And the floor operator is actually discussed in Module 1. 
It's got wow, like I completely paragraphs. missed it. <laughs> I, I, it's it's very easy to miss. Um. Yeah, I think do I do I say it? One point one point one six division and modulo. So it doesn't. Okay. The, the topic doesn't even talk. The 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 title does not even say floor operator. All right, I'll go back and review that. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's at like there's just like it may be a three sentence paragraph, but it may not be that much. So that's why you missed it. Because it just they're asking you to use it, but it's not highlighted. So um so does that help, Brian? Yes, it does. Like, I'll, cool. I'll go back and just review that 1.16 and see what else I missed. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to call it. You guys have a good evening. And um, I will see you next week, I hope. So, yeah, I'm going to stop the recording.